I learned a new word today. Atom bomb. It was like a white light in the sky. Like God taking a photograph. I saw it. These are nine films by Steven Spielberg, the most influential storyteller of the modern era. His tropes and trademarks as a film director are easy to identify. We have Broken Families, Tales of the American Experience, and Childhood Innocence. I can bring everyone back. But there's one element that connects all these films that carries the core of Spielberg's message. I can bring everyone back. Tragedy. Why is that family being broken? How many died for the American Experience? When does childhood end? The Holocaust? The atomic bomb, slavery, war, and everything that comes with it. I've never seen the like of it before, what I've seen today. Spielberg is a director shaped by catastrophe, who still finds the optimism and hope in a better tomorrow. Both trade towers, where thousands of people work, have now been attacked and destroyed. There is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes. So when you're America's storyteller, how do you respond after the defining tragedy of a new millennium seems to wipe all that hope away? This is Spielberg's 9-11 Trilogy. We'll be exploring three films here. Minority Report, about government surveillance and the sacrifice of liberties. War of the Worlds, about the attacks and specifically their effect on children, in Munich, about vengeance as a response to terrorism. Spielberg made two other films during his post-9-11 period, which both include air travel. But this is purely coincidence. His Tom Hanks comedy The Terminal would have certainly been a different film had it been made pre-9-11, but it was a movie made for the post-9-11 world rather than about it. To quote Spielberg himself, this is a time when we need to smile more. Hollywood movies are supposed to do that for people in difficult times. Let's start with Minority Report. Why'd you catch that? Because it was gonna fall. You're certain? Yeah, but it didn't fall. You caught it. The fact that you prevent it from happening doesn't change the fact that it was going to happen. While Minority Report was released in 2002, it finished principal photography in July of 2001, two months before the attacks. The script had been in development for a while too. It was originally planned as a sequel to the 1990 Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Total Recall. It wasn't made to be topical, but in the summer of 2002, Minority Report was the right film at the right time. The story follows John Anderton, a Washington, D.C. pre-crime officer in the year 2054. Pre-crime is a system that identifies future murders, allowing Anderton and his team to stop the crimes before they take place. When Anderton himself is revealed as a future murderer, he goes on the run in an attempt to prove the system wrong. When Minority Report was released less than a year after the attacks, it became the first film of the Patriot Act era exploring what we lose when we give up our freedoms for the guise of safety. The Patriot Act did not exist during the film's production, but even Spielberg admitted there's no denying the comparisons between Minority Report and the post-9-11 legislation. You're terrified! You're absolutely terrified right now! You don't want your kids to know terror. Keep them away from me! No science fiction film is more associated with the Iraq War than Starship Troopers, which came out six years before the war began. A story doesn't have to be from the present to be topical, and it's even more appropriate that Spielberg's film was about predicting the future. Electronic newspapers aside, the future predicted here is one of the most well thought out of any science fiction film. Spielberg wanted to see a future that could reasonably happen, and in our present we've already begun to see self-driving cars and intrusive advertisements, marketed directly to you. What Spielberg didn't know was only a matter of months after filming wrapped, the government would begin implementing the very concept of privacy invasion his film warned of. I'm sure you all understand the legalistic drawback to pre-crime methodology. Here we go again. Look, I'm not with the ACLU on this, Jeff. But let's not kid ourselves, we are arresting individuals who have broken no law. The program would be presented as something patriotic. If you're a law-abiding American citizen who has nothing to hide, then there's no reason to be afraid. The citizens of Minority Report are so indifferent to privacy invasions because it's become part of the American experience for them. This is what it means to be an American, to be safe. Obviously, for pre-crime to function, there can't be any suggestion of fallibility. After all, who wants a justice system that instills doubt? It may be reasonable, but it's still doubt. The illusion of safety requires making oneself blind. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. The man who sees becomes just as guilty as the man who kills. Freedom sacrificed for safety. 
Minority Report is one of the most effective examples of a predicted future in a film. Spielberg just didn't realize how close that future was. What is it? Is it terrorists? This, this came from someplace else. What do you mean, like Europe? No, Robbie, not like Europe! War of the Worlds has one of the most interesting public responses of any Spielberg film. It was a box office hit, but didn't sit well with some of the public because of two things. Number one, Tom Cruise was doing this. Have you ever felt this way? And number two, this was the first movie directly about the September 11th attacks. There have been other films set in their aftermath. War of the Worlds is, of course, about an alien attack, but there's no mistaking what its influence is. Some of these will be reaching, but let's look at the parallels. Eye level amateur footage, terrified onlookers, civilians running away from danger, dust covered survivors, missing posters, false rumors. You're got the worst of it. That's what everybody's saying. Cool. Someone said it was the British Airways hit the second world trade right in the middle. Objects falling from the sky, news reports, airplane crash site, blood banks reaching capacity, empty skies. Why aren't there any helicopters or airplanes? Bridge and boat evacuations. Joining the military for revenge. American flags. Hijackers headed to New York leave from Boston. War of the World starts in New York and ends in Boston. The weapons used in the attacks came from inside the country. Those machines, those tripods they got, they buried them. Right under our feet. And finally, childhood innocence. You know, I think childhood impressions are the thing that stay with you the rest of your life. Those are the things that never go away. You'll learn and forget things in your adult years, but you'll never forget your childhood. There's some post 9-11 parallels too, like this one. They can't occupy this country. Occupations always fail. History's taught us that a thousand times. A few of those are reaching, so keep in mind these are my opinions rather than facts. The point is, while not everything in this movie is about 9-11, every choice was made with 9-11 on Spielberg's mind. That mindset influenced what he did include just as much as what he chose not to include. Let's go back to the second point I made earlier, on the public's view. Here's a review titled, 9-11 was no summer movie. Steven Spielberg spends popcorn entertainment from the terrorist attacks. In it, the author argues that Spielberg's exploitation of the American tragedy is offensive rather than entertaining. It's too soon to be telling a story like this. You can find lots of similar reviews that believe it was too early to make this film, and whether positive or negative, it's rare to find any review that doesn't mention September 11th. When I was younger, I'm gonna be honest and say I didn't care for War of the Worlds. I had the common complaints about Fanning's non-stop screaming and the anticlimactic ending. But with time, I've come to defend the artistic choices made in the film, even if I still take issue with some of the plot. Spielberg intentionally makes War of the Worlds as visually different from the attacks as he can, while still including the before-mentioned parallels. You don't see a clear blue sky once in this movie, and it would have been a painful experience if you had. War of the Worlds has a grainy, bleached look, set against consistently cloudy skies. Our first shot is of Manhattan Island's new skyline looming in the background, but we never go there. Our horror takes place in New Jersey and the countryside. I'm sure when he made this film, Spielberg had a list in his head of things he could not do. No one falls to their death, no skyscrapers collapse, and no clear blue skies. When the action starts, War of the Worlds is a horrifying escape from terror that never made me feel as if the attacks were being exploited the way that some other films do. Those films did not follow the set rules Spielberg obviously put in place here, and my thoughts went to the real footage I'd seen instead of enjoying the fictional entertainment on the screen. No subject is taboo, Spielberg's proven that time and time again. It was bound to be seen as problematic to much of the public. But this is the kind of story that needed to be told after the attacks. The kind of film that had to be made eventually. Pretending we didn't have this trauma inside us is worse than seeing it manifested on screen. Movies and storytelling are therapy. Who better to transform our pain and loss of innocence than America's filmmaker? Forget peace for now. We have to show them we're strong. We have laws, we represent civilization. Some people say we can't afford to be civilized. I've always resisted such people. Because I don't know who these maniacs are and where they come from. Munich follows a secret Israeli assassin squad as they take revenge on Palestinians allegedly involved in planning the 1972 Black September Olympic attacks. Despite its namesake attack, Munich isn't about commenting on a specific moment. It's about commenting on the mindset. What good does vengeance do? You say to these butchers, you didn't want to share this world with us, then we don't have to share this world with you. Hatred was accepted post 9-11, and even encouraged by some. This is true of most any attack. It's us versus them. The, the, the lesson we should have taught them when the Olympics... You know, we let the Olympics continue Absolutely. after after the Israeli uh, athletes were oh, killed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We let it go on. 
we got to wipe out every man, woman, and child who thinks it's a good idea to blow themselves up. Yeah, remember Hiroshima, man. The Japanese now behave so beautifully. Power is when we have every justification to kill. And we don't. Following tragedy, for many, revenge and justice become the same thing. And they'll sacrifice whatever they must to achieve it. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. We can't help you because we never heard of you before. You do what the terrorists do. You think they report back to home base? Spielberg is a distrust of authority due to human error, and no government in this film is seen in a good light. Throughout his filmography, we see the attempt of total control leads to further anarchy. It's all an illusion. When we have control again. You've never had control. That's the illusion. I was overwhelmed by the power of this place. But I made a mistake, too. I didn't have enough respect for that power, and it's out now. The only thing that matters now are the people we love. He enjoys drawing parallels between his heroes and villains, often making them mirror images of each other. I am a shadowy reflection of you. In this scene, who's the hero and who's the villain? You'll all die old men in refugee camps waiting for Palestine. We have a lot of children. They'll have children, so we can wait forever. And if we need to, we can make the whole planet unsafe for Jews. You kill Jews and the world feels bad for them and thinks you're animals. Yes, but then the world will see how they've made us into animals. They'll start to ask questions about the conditions in our cages. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in Munich, there are no heroes. There's only vengeance. And what does that bring you? What does that bring you? Did we accomplish anything at all? Every man we kill has been replaced by worse. Why cut my fingernails? They'll grow back. Films set in the past can often benefit from the foreshadowing of the future. I want you to give me proof that everyone we killed had a hand in Munich. Upon Munich's release in 2005, the War on Terror was in its fourth year. Since then, more conflicts have begun. Other terrorist groups have risen, and men hungry for power and vengeance have taken the place of the dead. As Munich ends and its main character walks off screen, Spielberg's eye into America's soul pans up revealing New York's skyline. New York's old skyline. In Spielberg's worst catastrophes, he still finds hope. The Schindler Jews are saved. Private James Ryan lives a good life. And life finds a way. Munich ends in the past, in an America now unknown to us. And he leaves us in a question that's up to you. Do you choose vengeance? Or do you choose hope? Where were you on 9-11? America in September is a documentary film project collecting stories from all over the world. Visit AmericanSeptember.com to share your story and view the memories collected so far. If you'd like to see more videos on 9-11 history and its impact on culture, please subscribe to the channel.